It's been quite impressive listening to the different talks that people had here today. And um, I can't think of a better way to end a segment on ELP than to talk about food and the critical role it plays in our overall well-being. You know, when I saw the sketch, I smiled. I smiled real big because it reminded me of myself. You see, as a child, I was someone any parent would describe as a picky eater. I'll move my food from one side of the plate to the other, waiting for that perfect moment when I can sneak away without having to eat my food. Oftentimes, I'll be the last person in the dining room. Not because I was busy savoring the delicacy in front of me, but on the contrary, I spent the entire dinner time planning and scheming our best to dispose of my food without anyone seeing me. Most days, I get away with it. But one particular day, I was not that lucky. My plan was simple. I wrapped the food, toss it into the yard, close to the fence, under a shrub where no one would ever notice. Everything went according to plan until I threw the food. I threw it too hard, and I watched it go right over the fence into my neighbor's yard. <laughs> my neighbor happened to be in the yard at the time and watched it all unfold. Shocked at her unexpected delivery, she yelled out loud. My mom heard, and to cut the long story short, I had to go to my neighbor, apologize, and clean up the mess I made in our yard. It was an experience I never forgot. So while I was quite picky with food, I loved anything sweet. My mom is a great cook, and as a nurse, she often emphasized the importance of eating well. One of our favorite expressions was, you have what you eat. But neither our sayings nor our recommendations influenced my dining choices. My father was a marketing executive with a dairy company. They produced yogurt, ice cream, and a wide array of frozen beverages. So we had a good supply of these products at all times. And I never hesitated to indulge myself at any time. I grew up with an interesting perspective of our food. And that perspective shaped my dining choices. However, at some point, things changed. And things changed for me. So one of the things I saw was when I was growing up, science of food and health was not part of the conversation. And unfortunately, food and health education is still severely lacking in our society and our educational system today. It's a little known fact that children receive less than eight hours of food and health education in schools, compared to the 40 to 50 hours recommended by the CDC for behavioral change. And this is in a country where more than 50% of adults struggle with preventable chronic diseases that are related to poor eating patterns and physical inactivity. One in five children are considered obese. And this is three times the numbers that we had reported three decades ago when adults today were children. It's an undesirable trajectory that calls for change. I'm a geneticist and an educator. My research interest lies in understanding how bioactive compounds found in food interact with our genome to impact our health. I also create tools and resources for teachers to introduce the science of food and health in schools. Just like I was as a child, I know that many people out there that are uninformed about the critical role that food plays in our overall well-being. We can change that. So this is not about informing people about what is healthy for you and what is not. No. It's focused on helping people understand the science behind the food recommendations we make. So what do I mean? Think about this. Let's assume you enjoy eating broccoli. You enjoy eating your broccoli steamed. Maybe because you believe it's rich in antioxidants and it's good for you. Then someone comes along and recommends that you should eat your broccoli raw. Most likely, the first question you ask is, why? And if in response, you're told, well, because it's good for you, you get the full benefit of your meal that way, just eat it raw. Most likely, you won't be convinced because you still do not understand why. However, a more concise res response that sheds light on what happens when you eat your broccoli steamed compared to what happens 
when you eat your broccoli raw. My sway your decision when it comes to food preparation. So broccoli belongs to a class of vegetable we call cross vegetables. This vegetable has been studied extensively for a compound it contains. Now the compound is called isothiocyanate. Now, isothiocyanate has been shown by different studies to contain uh, different anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties and other health benefits as well, but it's not found in nature in this form. It's found in a different form, a compound called glucosinolate. So when you chew your vegetables, you bruise the leaves, exposing the different compartments, the contents of the different compartments of the plant to one another. So you expose glucosinolate to an enzyme called myrosinase. When myrosinase and glucosinolate are exposed to one another, then we have isothiocyanate formed. However, when you steam your vegetables, myrosinase is denatured and the availability of isothiocyanate is reduced. And that is one of the reasons why people talk about method of preparation when it comes to specific food types. Science helps us to understand the world around us. And there is a need for us to promote the science of food and health in our schools, from grade school to grad schools, helping people understand the reason why, the answering the question why. I want to leave with this. There is a powerful connection between the food you eat and your health outcomes. And there is a need to take steps to be informed and empowered to, take a, to shape a healthier future through nutrition. For this to happen, three things are important. Number one, you need to explore opportunities to learn more about food and your health. Now, you don't have to wait that until there's a symptom or a problem to take action. You can take action today. I know there are many resources out there that people read, but I recommend that you look for resources authored by dietitians, physicians, scientists in academic communities or scientists um, with government agencies as well. Number two, we need to speak up. We need to speak up where possible, advocating for food and health education in our schools and our community centers as well. Finally, we need to invest in the next generation. Invest in educating the next generation about the importance of food to their overall well-being so that that generation will not have to deal with some of the challenges our generation is dealing with today. It doesn't matter if you are an uncle, an auntie, a godfather, a godmother, regardless of the role you play in the lives of those children. There is a need to lead by example, creating a supportive environment for food and health conversations at home. We all have an important role to play in shaping a healthier future for generations to come. We need to leverage the power of food education to awaken the natural curiosity in our children so that when they ask us why they should eat a particular meal, we provide a science-backed rationale for their food choices. We need to change our approach to health education, helping people understand why their food choices matter, because an informed eater is a healthier eater. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.